beautiful day in Houston, Texas. Roundabouts. A leaf ish, I think is where I'm at at the moment. I guess Houston's pretty big. I live in Richmond, which is on the outer outskirts. Um, and yet, you know, I still refer to where I live as Houston. Quotation marks. Bunnies hopping. I turned off the AC for good sound in here, but I see the camera rumbling, and I wonder if that sounds really bad. As an audio technician, I have to think about these things, but on a zero dollar budget, I also have to get you what a good deal. Spending a dime. Well, an extra dime. I probably spent money, obviously, with the phone and, you know, this and that here and there. I hope everyone's being safe out there. I've decided to obviously have my mask with me. But then the person next to me driving is wearing the mask. And I wonder if that is... I mean, it's a personal choice, I guess. Much as anything in life. I made this personal choice to do this right now for you here. Ugh. I turned off the AC and now I'm melting in my car because it's not exactly cool here in Houston, Texas on July 26th, 7th? So it's like, I don't know. Oh, and then I had these glasses in here, which are not something I've worn. I remember getting these at a dollar store once and they were HD glasses is what they alleged to be. And, um, uh, I gotta say, the quality's not much better. I feel like a buffoon, first of all. Also, like, I'm about to be in a Backstreet Boys video. Or was it in sync? I don't know. I didn't listen to those bands. I was more of a Led Zeppelin, Black Sabbath, Doors, Beatles, Pink Floyd fan. With an occasional sprinkling of other classic rock people here and there. But you may know that already. <laughs> okay. So yeah, I've been going back, watching my show. I don't know why I'm wearing those. And it's, it's a multitude of things. It's partially embarrassing, but it's also partially um, satisfying to not be that person. I am still somehow the same human being, but I feel like I've lived two or more very completely different lives and I'm thankful for that for the ability to have been presented with so many different trajectories in life um, and that honestly some of them didn't work out for better or worse um, I could not be happier to be the human being I am today here now um, than I am I mean I, I could be happier I suppose Given my health and that I'm alive, I could not be happier. Earlier this year, I stopped drinking, and the mental fog that lifted from me because of that has put so many things in perspective that I fear, had I not uh, changed my ways, may never have changed, or may not have changed in the same way, may have put me in a riskful place as far as maybe drinking during this whole quarantine. Um, which would have diminished my, uh, immune system. Having a hard time finding that word. Mm -hmm. So anyway, yeah, it's, uh, it's just been interesting to have the retrospective too. I heard the comedian Hannibal Buress on one of the talk shows, but talking about how he audited his time with drinking and found that he didn't have, he had more negative experiences than positive experiences. And I, though I've had fun with drinking, I feel like it's put more of a, been more detrimental to my life um, than anything else that I can honestly look at and analyze and say. I've made bad choices, sure. But, you know, I wonder how many of them have been fueled by a foggy mind related to drinking and related to um, the effects of alcohol on one's mind and the fog around that, which for me, apparently, is just very detrimental, very bad.
bad mojo. Nobody wants that. You don't want some bad mojo, getting you? Do you? Right. I don't know. I don't really know if that's uh, what all this is about. I have slipped into like a Jeff Goldblum moment. Uh, oh my god. Another thing occurred to me. I'm gonna. I'm sorry, I'm stopping. Maybe I shouldn't be that guy. I have a beef with drivers who, for whatever reason, think they can force you to drive faster than you're supposed to be driving. Which I, there was a time when I was just staying at the house, and then I started driving around more, um, just to kind of have a change of scenery, but in doing that, I felt like I was almost run off the road a few times, and especially in my neighborhood, the impatience is just, uh, palpable, and I don't like it, because I'm more patient, maybe, than some. Sometimes, relatively speaking. You should probably be more attentive to the calls around me. But, right. experience where I was in the middle of my Jesus mindset and mode and I wanted to get away from my family because I mean everything had been chaotic at the house and I just felt like I had no escape and I had this sort of mental road trip planned where I would go visit Paul's Valley and my friend Travis who lived up in Oklahoma City at the time well I I wanted to also go visit, I wanted to also go visit Turner Falls because as a kid, my whole family went to Turner Falls and it was a beautiful place. It was this serene, you know, natural spring kind of place where the water was cold to the touch and it would make you feel, I mean, it, they said it turned our skin blue when we were kids because it was so cool, but, uh, I, years later, got married in front of this waterfall in Tur Tur Turner Falls, and uh, I decided I would go back there, go visit, and so when I went up to, I was driving in this state of mind that was so beyond what I can conceive now, because it was so assured in its, I don't know, it was like I knew I was supposed to become Jesus. And in the midst of that, I'm driving and having this, you know, existential crisis. But then I go to Turner Falls because, you know, I want to have this connection with this place that was rooted in my youth and in my marriage because it was this, like, constant through life. And when I went up there, I went down, I parked my car beside this ledge that led down to the water. And I... If I recall correctly, I climbed down the ravine and got down into the water, at least to where my feet were in the water, just so I could feel it and have that connection, I guess, to the earth and to my past. And so I climbed back up and started to get over to my car, but then I noticed there was an 18-wheeler parked, and I don't know if it had been there before, you know, in my state of mind, I may have been just oblivious to it, but I walked over and saw there was a guy there, and in the moment, I thought this man was my dad in disguise, and he looked like a mixture of my dad and Santa Claus, and in my mind's eye, I considered this to be like God manufacturing a play and a stage for me to live out this strange facade on. And so I thought it was my dad slash 
Santa slash God, something was happening there. It was very bizarre. But then there was another man behind the 18-wheeler. And at the time, I thought this was my uncle because they shared a somewhat similar resemblance to my uncle. And I thought, you know, that these two men were just my family on this stage, right? So... So when they came, when I came up and saw these men, I had been smoking, I believe, and offered to smoke with them. But then we stood next to this man's truck and it was like this other man who seemed to be my uncle, or I thought was my uncle, he nuzzled up to the side of me and touched my hand with his hand. Like, it was just like way too close, so it just kept touching. And I kept feeling this, and I looked, and I said, do you want to hold my hand? Is that what, like, is that what you're trying to do? I don't know. And so I held his hand, and I felt so innocent about this at the time because, I mean, in my mind, this was just normal. This was like a stage play playing out, and it was like, you know, I was unable to comprehend anything besides that. And I had this innocent, I'm going to hold your hand, and you know, hopefully accomplish what you're trying to accomplish. I have no idea who these men are, what their actual motive or agenda is over here. I knew I had to get into this water, come out, and then I just decided, well, it's, you know, it's my dad and my uncle, so I'm going to go smoke with them, even though it's this, you know, but that's not what was happening. I was just in a different state of mind, and thank God, or whatever, that I was not killed, molested, Whatever. Um, I'm still here to tell the tale, you know, unscathed, relatively speaking. So it's, you know, it's just interesting because life is trippy. In case you didn't know. But I'm sure you know. Didn't you know? I know. Whoa. Tripping on ass. Hey everybody, my name is Chris Mullins. I had this idea earlier in the year, even before the pandemic, to maybe bring back my show in one form or another, and when I sort of went over some ideas of what I would do, I thought maybe sharing my experiences would better suit the Chris Mullins experience, as it were. So here I am in uh, Colorado. What a hell of a trip that was. And I'd like to take this opportunity to talk to you about drugs. All the names, dates, and locations have been changed for this story, except for me. The first instance of becoming aware of drugs was within the public school uh, and within the D.A.R.E. program. I don't know what it was, what they said or did or showed, but something about their program, something left me with this absolute fear. I sort of categorize drugs, no matter the type or their effect. As long as it fit under that banner of a so-called drug, I was convinced that there must be something wrong. Well, the branding of drugs as being criminal, while true for some drugs, is not true for all of the drugs. Take marijuana, for instance. It took me so long in my life of even thinking to conceive of smoking because it had been so villainized through my life and I was so worried about it being a drug. Throughout history, unfortunately, certain drugs have been used as justification for racial profiling and racist agendas that the vilification of the drug was really more about who was doing it than the drug itself. And I think Jim Belushi talked about that a little on a Bill Maher not too long ago. Kudos to him for growing his own. I'd love to be in business with somebody to make a strain called the Chris Mullins Experience. I know I would smoke it. Far too often some of the stigmas of the fears about drugs is paid more attention to than the drugs themselves. Now you find in Colorado things like hallucinogens, like magic mushrooms as they're called, are now being used in therapy. And weed is medicinal. 
and started as medicinal in many states before it became recreational. This thing America criminalized for so long with no real justification is now found in soda form. Would you like some Bubba Kush root beer? Or perhaps some Keef Cola? So many things like this are these byproducts of this plant that for too long was unjustly criminalized. There's a lot of injustice in this world. At any point when the criminal justice system becomes a for-profit market, uh, there's a serious problem. And too many people paid the price that don't need to while other people are making money off of it. And it's just frankly, it's fucking sick. These so-called illicit and illegal drugs are a great thing to slap that label on when you have other things that are perfectly legal, such as alcohol, which can be far more detrimental than many of these other drugs. This I got in Colorado at the Nature's Gift Shop. This is perfectly legal in Colorado. This is perfectly legal down the road in Rosenberg because it's CBD. Texas is taking this weird approach of testing the waters with the CBD thing. You can find CBD just about anywhere in Texas now. While CBD is all good and fine and available any and all places, the thought of that maybe even five years ago would have been insane because of the criminal fear behind weed. That's nice. Tally-ho! From a young age I got into Pink Floyd and their founding member Sid Barrett was well known for taking too many psychedelics and going so far over the edge of his mind that he wasn't able to return. And that always to me was a cautionary tale for drugs. So when I bought into the fear mongering of the D.A.R.E. program, it just reinforced that sort of fear that there could potentially be irreversible damage. That I do not condone drug use for everyone. I don't think that even pot could work for everybody the same way it worked for me but I wanted to share with you why I decided to start smoking in the first place and what led me to enjoy this from hating it so much or being so blind to the fact that I could enjoy it maybe. I had a fear of the reefer for so long because of this propaganda and fear mongering that I never smoked in high school. I waited until I was probably 21 or 22 while I was married a big part of the reason I even attempted to smoke was towards the end of my marriage. My wife wanted to smoke and I felt very uncomfortable about it at first because I wasn't sure about how smoking would affect her and I didn't want to be around drugs. I wanted to try it to see if it could help us bond more um, and honestly it was almost like a red pill effect of showing me the world around me and me becoming more aware of my surroundings and my lifestyle and everything. Whatever it is that connects with your synapses that effectively helped me focus and see through my marriage, especially as it started spiraling downward. Essentially, I was eating my emotions. I feel like it was not very long after that that honestly I got a divorce and moved back to Houston. Another aspect of smoking that affected me greatly. I was able to come to this place of realization that I needed to change my life and my ways because I was not eating healthy. It helped me sort of mentally focus down on the fact that I was eating my emotions and not coping with the reality around me. And it helped me lock down and start walking every day and paying attention to what I was eating and drinking and somewhat. <laughs> Almost like just a connection in the synapses that was missing. Okay, so experiences. Let's talk about some experiences I've had. Once I smoked pot and enjoyed it, I was open to the idea that I might enjoy some other things. However, let me take you on a list of things I have not done. I tell people this ever so often, but I have never cocained. I have never done crack. I had a friend tell me that a video of mine on Snapchat looked a little meth-ish. I have never done meth. Just want to put that out there. I have never done DMT or mescaline or peyote. Because I have not experienced these things, I cannot speak to them to any great detail. I can tell you that I just personally don't find them necessary at this current interval of my life. Did I miss anything? Oh yes, although I do like some music with a good little beat, I've never been much of an EDM guy, and thus I've never been into the rave scene, or the molly scene, or the uppers, and whatever. I'm not a pill popper. Not that there's anything wrong with that? I wouldn't know. Okay, so as far as the things I have done, obviously, I am a fan 
I think that this little plant has done so much good for our earth. Anywhere that is fully legalized, this is done pretty well. Outside of weed, a few years ago, 2016 I believe, I tried shroom tea for the first time, which was an immaculate experience because it made me feel like a child again in this wholly innocent way. Just want to stress how innocent the feeling is. It's so easy to have a prejudice against a drug uh, without ever trying it if you leave it in the label of a drug, which has always been this fear-driven thing. If you go to the fundamental science of what it is doing to your brain and the chemical reactions, then maybe we would learn something. If people had more of a conversation about drugs and trying to move past these stigmas and learn something and grow and adapt as a society, hey, if we could evolve, that would be great. <laughs> You might hear this a lot with people that have done drugs, but it is good to be outdoors and it's good to experience nature. It's almost as though the way we live as humans and the way technology has taken over our lives uh, it pushes us further and further from nature. I keep reiterating this, but we need the earth way more than it needs us. So I tried this shroom tea. Instead of being in nature, I was indoors and watching a nature documentary. A common thread with psychedelics is this sort of... It's almost an impossibility to stop laughing and to stop giggling and stop smiling and stop feeling good. It's indescribable. It is literally something you have to experience for yourself. But, for me, it was like an injection of every positive feeling I've ever had through my body and mind and soul. To criminalize or to even prejudice that without knowing... Um, is wild, but it just tells you how much a hold other people have on your own opinions. You have to truly gain your own opinion for yourself, but you do have to be willing to try to gain that opinion. You can't just... So, I don't know if it's kicking in or not, because I don't know how that works. I'm watching this nature documentary, and then I just start giggling, and then I just can't stop giggling, and then it's like suddenly, I want to be outside. My whole being felt the need to connect with the sun and just be, but I'm in an apartment complex. I do remember riding down the street with my then girlfriend's roommate who was listening to this eerie church music. It was like the most sinister church chapel music. It made me start feeling clenched up inside, which in turn made me just sort of like close off because it just felt creepy and eerie and then my mind suddenly triggered you're probably just tripping and this is all i asked if they could please kindly change the radio station because it was it was starting to make me feel a little odd to put on a the door song the spy which is a fucking great tune i started feeling that song and singing it immediately which was great. I just remember the sensations of feeling whole and feeling just utter love for everything and existence. And there is sort of a benchmark in that. The sensation of feeling such immaculate joy can do so many wonders for your life and your mind and bring you from a dark place to a very bright and positive place. I also had this fear of having a bad trip and not knowing what that would be, of course, um, judging that it would be something I couldn't fathom and it would just, you know, detriment my soul. I didn't know. The first time I tried acid, it was a bad trip, but not in the way I could have ever fathomed, if that makes sense. So the first time I tried acid, I was at a party. I was not even aware acid was there or happening. Later, someone brings out a tray that just had individual tabs. They offered it to me and I was reluctant because I had been drinking and I was not sure if I should go into something that was so heavy um, while I was already under the influence of a different thing. I, I knew that there might be a problem. Somebody was there who said, you can drink as much as you want. Because I already had a few, I was easily influenced to say, okay, let's go for it. 
I would say much like Shrooms, there was a bit of a moment of just utter laughter and just pure joy that was uncontainable almost. Unfortunately, it was followed shortly thereafter with the feeling of an oncoming headache. It warped into the feeling of an oncoming hangover and it felt like I was feeling this joy and levity that can't be explained. But then it was like this grasp of hangover started weighing on me and boring down into me. So once I started feeling like I was having a hangover, it started turning south and I started feeling like, well, I'd like to be alone to try to get rid of this. I had another pair of Sennheiser headphones with me that I was able to block in my music and the music such a beautifully indescribable experience, like time itself slowed down while these words uh, came out. On top of it was this grinding headache hangover, and it was getting worse and worse. And then it was just unavoidable. It was there, and it was not leaving. And I kind of dealt with that all night. Remember going in this truck at one point and trying to get comfortable and listen to more music, but it just... It did not make the headache go away, unfortunately. Last year, I had the privilege and honor of working on a local indie production called Acid Test. Look them up. It sort of had me interested in maybe attempting to try that again with no alcohol, no inebriation on top of going into something. Earlier this year, I did in fact try it again. And it was simply one of the most beautiful experiences I can honestly tell you I've ever had in my existence. I don't know if I've ever been this appreciative of life and grateful for everything that I've ever experienced. I hope if you ever decide to do something that you can form your own opinion of it without being influenced by what the outside world thinks. And ultimately, if I had never tried to step outside my boundary, I would have never discovered that. Don't judge a book by its cover. Bring on the peyote, I don't mind. Of all the drugs I have taken, I feel like alcohol by far outweighs the detrimental effects of any of them. Expect better from you, me. You need to do better. Better. How do I do better? I got the scripts. I gotta write scripts. I gotta do the comics. I gotta make the music. I gotta do the extra. I gotta walk the four miles. God, there's so much. So much. And no more alcohol. Possibly even bigger answers. What is existence? Is this time finite or is it infinite? Do we have free will? Hmm. Next year's 2021. I wonder what that will bring. Is it finite? 
Or is it infinite? Do we have free will? Eighty-seven. Uh, momentary lapse of reason came out. Eighty-eight was delicate sound of thunder. Ninety-four. Division bell. Ninety-nine. The year I moved to Houston, Texas. Two thousand three, the year I graduated high school. Two thousand four, worked at AMC. Two thousand five. Two thousand six, moved to Oklahoma, got married. Two thousand seven, the CME of Halloween Day was made for the first time. Two thousand eight, I got a divorce and moved back to Houston, Texas, 2009. Lost a lot of weight, interned on my first independent movie film set. 2010, began reading the Bible. Arguably lost my mind. 2011, psychosis induced, much more insane. 2012, felt a little apocalyptic. 2013, things were evening out 2014, I was starting to work on bigger productions. 2015, 2016, things are chugging along. 2017 was a great year in which many things occurred. Many opportunities blossomed before me. 2018 was all right. In 2019, things were starting to get rough for me. I was reverting back to a more primal version of myself, not benefiting me in the now. This year, 2020, has been one of the most insane years known to man, and woman, and children, and animals. At no point in time are we able to reverse time or work backwards through it. We're only ever moving forward. And there will never come a chance in time in which we can change the past outcome to alternate our futures. We have to live within the means of the current arrow of time we're currently in. Is time fixed? Are we the variables changing the outcome? Or something like that. And I don't think these are corrective lenses. What? will 2021 bring? Hmm. Let's think about this. Now versus the future. If time is fixed, and everything always was and will be, what are you doing to change any of it? Do you have free will, or is it simply your perception? Time being fixed, forever changing, might answer whether or not we have free will. And whether the choices that we make were already chosen, so to speak, or always embedded in time. If the framework of time allows for variation, that would be one thing. But if time is in fact fixed, then what are we really doing to change what already was or would have been? It's a quandary. Definitely a quandary. But you see, none of it even matters. I still have to get back to doing my scripts, doing my comics, doing my music, which I love to do. I've always had a bit of a philosophical view on many things in life, including time. And if time has taught me anything, it's that we actually have to take time to make time. I feel I have an obligation to continue to keep myself in check and always moving progressively forward for myself, for the people around me, which is a pretty easy concept to grasp, although I am guilty myself of not taking time, utilizing my time in better ways. And this year, amongst everything else, I've truly found value in myself and my time. If I don't make time to take time to do the things I need to do, 
then I'll never get to all of them. But if I do, in fact, take time to make time to do the things I want to do, I can do all of them, and more. And I have done that this year, and I hope you find the time to do the things you need to do in your own life. Until next time, this has been another Chris Mullins Experience. What is the air velocity of an unladen swallow? Hmm. My friend is just, you know. Why does my mind circle around you? Why do planets wonder what it would be like to be you? And at this point we hear West Virginia mountain music. I remember my first communion pretty well. Not that I knew what I was doing, just the event itself. I remember specifically going into the confession booth and talking to the priest. The priest was speaking very broken English, very hard for me to understand. And I recall just saying, what? Over and over again, because he kept repeating what he was saying for me to say something. But because I couldn't understand a word he was saying, I just kept asking, what? And eventually he kicked me out of the booth. Obviously, I uh, just couldn't understand what he was saying. Now this book has changed my life. For better, for worse, it has altered the course of my life as well as many lives through the course of the history of this planet, which is pretty insane. I took a little more literal the words written in this than maybe one should to the point that I felt called and drawn to attempt in my feeble mind uh, to fulfill it. In that year, we had an intense visitation of energy. Jesus H. Well, happy birthday, little guy. He looks like a brother I didn't have. Now it's Easter. When you see things like this, you could tell why people like me might think they were Jesus. This man was actually born in the Middle East, allegedly. Probably did not look so American, if I had to guess. In the right frame of mind, Anything is possible in thought with the right combination of antipsychotics and other stimulants of this world. It's not too far-fetched to see how somebody can gain such a fundamentalist view of one's own belief, especially if they take it literally, which is what I did as I kept reading this book. I think it was 2009. That year my life just seemed to take such a drastic turn in so many different directions all at once. I had been divorced and moved back for about half a year. That was the year I bought my car, my orange Kia Rio. I also started going to school at Warden County Junior College and I took courses both online and at the campus. At that same time, I was also working at Be Unique, basically continuing the job that I had started up in Oklahoma working for my ex-wife's dad, where I laser engraved and did graphic design work for trophies and plaques and shirts in this case. It was interesting. It was a lot of creativity going on. It was also the first year that I interned on a film set, which gave me a broader scope of what it was I wanted to get myself into. Around that same time was when I first started trying to diet. I had gotten pretty hefty up to the point that I remember looking at the scale and seeing my weight at 295 and thinking if I gain five more pounds, I'll be 300 pounds. And that was so disheartening to me because I had remembered a day in middle school of just being much more athletic because I was on the football team. I had come so far from that. And part of that, you know, was the fact that I was eating my emotions relating to what I felt was failure in my marriage and trying to start that life, which just didn't work out for me. One other thing I was sort of getting into pretty heavily at the time were these physics books by Brian Greene. He took such complex ideas 
related to physics and the mathematics and simplified them for somebody like me to understand, which started to change my perception of reality around me. Due to all the experiences I had had, I was starting to write music, and it was like all of these things were hitting me at once. Part of me came to the realization that I had had this faith through my entire life leading up to this point. Even though it was a constant through my life, I had never quite taken the time to read this book to its fullest. I've realized that while I was at church during any given time, we would kind of only go through one particular scripture at a time, and it was never in order. And I decided I wanted to know more about this because it could better help educate me on my own belief and faith. It certainly would help me see the bigger picture for myself and why everyone else sought truth through this book. While I changed my diet completely, and I was starting to read the Bible more and learn more about physics, all of these things in combination were building up within me. And then, September 9th, 2009, I believe, the Beatles Remastered catalog was released. I had a brand new car, and at some point I had gotten a hold of this collection. It was a simple car, but the sound quality in it was so great, impressed me so much, and musically moved me. This building and welling up of all these things that I was falling in love with and becoming obsessed with, including the Bible, were elevating my perception of the world around me in almost hyperactive excitement. In losing as much weight as I did, I'd lost almost 100 pounds and not replacing my nutrients or trying to make up for it in any way. It shifted the paradigm of my chemical balance which got hyper-focused, frankly, on the words of the Bible. As soon as I realized I hadn't read this book, it dawned on me how many more people hadn't read it, yet base seemingly their life and purpose on it, which is something I certainly had done to a degree. I believe by that point I was getting into the New Testament and the story of Jesus, which I had only really had a surface knowledge of. I've always felt moved by the story of Christ, which obviously for the holidays, some of that nuance is lost. When I had first started reading the Bible, it was because I didn't have a full knowledge of it. I had only had these fractional bits. And the same with Jesus. I really wanted to know the full on story and found I connected with the words of Jesus, I identified with it completely. Through the perception of this being literal, try to live a life that was similar in value to the words of Christ. I felt very passionate about it in this hyper-elevated way. I took his words so literally. I sold all of my possessions at one point. I got myself down to such a minimalist life. However, when I had lost a lot of weight, I was starting to feel a chemical imbalance. It coincided with reaching revelations. When I had read revelations, it was like I had a collapse of spirit and mind because I had to come to terms with the fact that that book spelt the doom of the earth, that this bringing about of Christ's return was also the ending of the world as we knew it. There was a conflict in my mind with how that could be real and people could be basically rooting on this and wishing for this. It dawned on me that this book is open to interpretation and revelations especially could mean many different things to many different people. Obviously those that don't believe in it may find it invalid. The duality of knowledge of revelations and the return of Jesus versus the destruction and ending of the world had me considering that it just may not be as it's written and that there may be a different way to interpret it. Somehow, in how I felt so connected with it and identified with Jesus, I felt as though to return as Christ would be a choice someone had to make to fulfill. And I felt like that was my duty. I said duty. And I felt like I had to question myself for so long before I accepted that as a truth that this was my purpose, that this was why I was here. But I don't know if you've tried to ascend or bring about the end times, but it's not uh, possible. That presented to be a problem. Obviously convincing anyone else that you think this is true is not an easy task. And there were many times that I became combative and I lashed out at my family and my friends 
and those around me that were trying to support me. It was very hard once I got into this mental spiral to know how to unwind myself from it because I committed full throttle to attempting to become the entity of the return of Christ. Not something you casually say at a party. But it is the truth of the life I've lived and the experience I had. Having read this book, I certainly think that more people should read it just to know the contents therein. I have accepted that if a God exists in any form, these books do not at all well represent a creator of all of existence. If you're a believer, if you're a non-believer, I think that you can gain something from this. Whether it's a psychosis-induced, God-complex, Jesus freakout, or personal coming to peace, or a break from religion altogether, which is my own personal quest. Everyone needs to have their own, and I don't think it's enough for a preacher to tell you what to believe or feel. And in any given sense, believer or non-believer, you should try to find the truth for yourself and not rely on someone else's word of what it is. Because otherwise it's all just hearsay, including the words of this. Maybe we'll find out after we die. Seems like a really bad insurance policy, but hey, maybe you'll learn something. I don't know. Talking about religion and gaining a better understanding of it should be something we vie to do. I feel like we just need to be a better educated society. For some reason, the stubbornness of belief, of not lending any space or room for an outside thought, can be troubling. There's part of that I will never be able to see past in how in one breath Jesus speaks of peace and love and compassion and yet for some reason he is used as some tool to justify some people's wealth or their prosperity or their vanity to some degree which is literally nothing to do with what Jesus was here to preach and speak about. I came to a crossroads at one point where I saw the whole of my actions and the whole of my faith in life and thought, now I had no tangible reason to believe in it. I feel like in some sense it had failed me because it didn't save me from this point of no return or what I felt like was no return. There was a sense that after I lost my faith that life didn't bear the same purpose or meaning and it was very hard for me to find that and to see a true reason that wasn't related to this thing I had known all my life. But to be so far removed from that now on the other side of this and to know that I have found hope, I have found my own purpose again, that is not related to the story of this book. If anything, it's related to the character of Christ, which I still to this day relate to on one flip side in a non-religious sense. I started seeing one doctor, therapist, psychiatrist, I'm not sure which, who I recall saying at one point because of something I said that clearly he's psychotic. She prescribed me something called Seroquel, which I recall making me feel like my brain was disconnecting from itself. Later I found out that that doctor's practice had closed and I felt very bewildered about how my brain had been treated. I have to thank my family for having all the patients in the world because I put them through literal hell trying to be Jesus, trying to prove this, trying to point out flaws and trying to rain judgment for lack of a better description because I felt justified in this place. When I had this lapse of faith, it was almost as though I could see all that and I could see how people took something and twisted it into something it wasn't and fully believed in it and it just it hurt me in my senses and it made me feel further from what society had warped this book into versus what I got out of it when I read it. I saw another doctor that talked to me, let me vent, let me kind of explode because there was a lot of anger associated with feeling trapped in myself and that I couldn't prove my point or prove that I was supposed to be the return of Jesus, which there's no logistical way to prove that or to expect your family to be on board with you feeling this way. 
So I see this other therapist and he puts me on a different medicine. When I was on this medicine, it sort of chilled me out. It got me to a different level because I was having outbursts of anger. I was lashing out in judgment to my family and making existence so hard to cope with for those around me. I felt like the more and more I took this medicine, it was like I was losing the reins on my mind and it was like I felt more disconnected from myself. I remember a time in which I felt like I was in a quasi-vegetative state. I was hardly functioning whatsoever. I was mostly mute. And I remember my dad having bought me this Zelda game, Skyward Sword, which on the Wii made you swing the remotes around so that you could swing your sword and shield and whatnot. I remember playing that game amidst feeling vegetative and feeling like, to a degree, it kind of churned me out of it. You had to read the text of the game to move along in the story. And I feel like that helped me spark a reconnection to myself. This year has truly helped me look at everything that has happened in my life, including this big event and the journey I've had from that moment to now and make better sense of it to how it will apply to my future and to how I need to live from here on out. I feel like all of these things, as hard as they were in my life, that happened, did happen for a reason. Even though that experience was insane. Without that experience, I don't know where I would be today, but I would not be in the same place. I would not be the same person. It changed me and altered my path. But to that end, I'm so grateful to be alive, to be here, to be present of mind, I feel like last year, especially with how I was drinking, I started to throw that away for some reason. And we can't always see these reasons that we want to escape ourselves. Even religion to an extent gives you some solution for the problems you are seeking to fix within yourself. I feel like we would just be better as a society if we learned how to do that individually instead of a one-size-fits-all scenario in a Bible or a Book of Mormon or a Dianetics or the Bhagavad Gita or any religious text. There is a truth and a meaning and purpose within yourself that these texts will not necessarily even lead you to. It's within your own reach to find yourself and come to terms with your beliefs and your values, how they apply to you and how you want to apply them to those around you. I hope that you and I are able to live out a life filled with compassion and love and honesty. I feel we owe that to each other as human beings that all live on this planet together. I know that maybe everyone does not share that view, but maybe they don't have to. I just hope for peace to all mankind and love. Love is all you need if you give peace a chance, man. Thank you.